Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined by the voice of the UFC, Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Go, I'm, I'm good, Ken. Um, what can I say? You didn't congratulate me on the Raiders uh, being 3-0, and but I, <laughs> I will take it as just a little slip of the mind. You, you know, it's got nothing to do with New England going down pretty bad. But um, I know it doesn't have anything to do with that. Actually, you know, you would never, <laughs> you would never hold that kind of uh, grudge, but uh, and and begrudge a, a friend his dues and for his son's team. But um, the Raiders are three and zero and just win, baby. They're the cardiac kids. They are the cardiac. I don't know if I can make it through the season the way they're winning these. I don't. I, I might not make it. <laughs> really, I, I I might meet meet um. You know, respiratory help or some kind of, uh, you know, respiration or something, whatever that is. But um, I, I might have to have an EMT team like on the ready because the way they win is just it's it's tough. They should put a like a Surgeon General's warning up. Like if you're on any kind of heart medication, watch the Raiders at your own risk because <laughs> it, it, it's it's rough. But they got plenty of heart, plenty of character, plenty of weapons. Cars doing great. They got those weapons. Oh my goodness, they they have offensive weapons all over the place. Uh, but <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. My my son is happy. I'm happy. Mayock's happy. Gruden's happy. I'm sure they all are. So let's see if we can keep it going. And uh, that was a hell of a game. Oh man! And the first game of the year was was just cardiac city, right? I mean, it's it's just yeah. it's, it's craziness. It, it really is. Uh, we all speaking watch of it. crazy. Did you see the kid from Baltimore hit a 66-yard field goal yesterday? Yeah, unbelievable. I was watching it live. That guy's oh my so God, good. That guy's so good. He's like laser. He's like a robot. But um, that he's he's really good. But yeah, they they uh they broke the heart of um. That was the last second uh, to win it. Uh, who did they beat? They beat uh, Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, Poor De bastards. Yeah, Detroit. Heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> Detroit's having a tough time. Yeah, they. They haven't been able to win a game yet. I'm sure that that was heartfelt what you just said uh, about them, the the Motor City <laughs> kids. But um, Tommy Hearns can't be too happy. I don't know. No. Nope. You know. Well, and the Patriots laid an egg. They do not look good. Hey, look, you got a rookie quarterback who's going to be the real deal. Uh, I believe yeah. my son believes. But hey, he's a rookie. You know what I mean? Yep. You, you, you're gonna have. Yeah. You're gonna have those games. You're gonna have those bumps in the woody. Have three interceptions. I mean, I don't think he had yeah. any interceptions the first couple games. But uh, you're gonna have. You know, you're gonna have those bumps in the road. I mean, that's part of the growth. And then to add insult to injury, the Red Sox got swept by the Yankees in a battle for the play, for the last wild card spot, coming down to the wire. Yeah, I thought that was Tough a good day thing. for New England. I, mean, I, I thought that was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I forget who. I'm sorry. I got selfish for a moment. I pull myself back. <laughs> hey, listen, before we go on, really, because I don't want it to get lost for talking about heartfelt. Um, good luck. I know you're leaving tomorrow. Uh, within like 24 hours, you're leaving to London uh, for the London Marathon, which will be on Sunday. And um, best of luck. And we, all the fans, everybody, I talk for them. I speak for them. Everybody's behind you. Everybody's wishing you the best of luck. And uh, we know you're going to do great. Thank you, thank you. I've got some. I've got. I've received some nice uh, messages on Instagram from the fans. So thank you to everyone. Looking forward to um, getting out there. But you're gonna bring talk. the heart. I, I, we'll get to it later. But I know you're gonna bring the. You're gonna bring the mastery of Usyk and the heart of Volkanovski and and um, Ortega. Right? Was that Ortega? Yeah. Then, yeah. I mean, that's those, right. you talk. Of, we'll get into that later. But the, that's like a different realm of heart. That's that's yeah. like, that's like. A, a twilight dimension that's a different dimension of heart uh, that's what <laughs> i actually, talk about the cold yeah that's about the cold the cold of a samurai the cold of a warrior it, it is you know uh, uh death before surrender so um yes uh, anyway we'll get into that later but uh go get them go get them baby the those kind of examples that you just mentioned, Usyk and especially Volkanovski, Volkanovski and um, Ortega, are examples that people should, could and should use in their everyday life. Because even when I'm running a race, I think to myself when things get really hard and you're suffering, 
Well, no one's trying to choke me unconscious or smash elbows into my forehead. I think I can take a little bit more suffering from a cardiovascular standpoint. So it does provide motivation and hopefully others get that from the podcast and some of the messages you deliver. Well, listen, 100%. The guys we just mentioned and you just mentioned, um, for me, besides being great competitors, great champions, uh, great, you know, just great at what they do, uh, they're teachers, See, to your point, they're teachers. They teach us that we can go further. Yeah, if we dare. Yes. If we dare. They, the greatest thing about them, they take flashlights into dark places. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. They put light into places that were dark before. And we can do the same thing. Again, like you said, we don't have to be taking elbows and knees to our head to do it. But in whatever realm of life we're in, whatever vocation we're in, whatever, whatever we're chasing, we're all chasing something. Go a little further. Go a little further. Remember, okay. there was a day, there was a day of many years ago where people were afraid to go too far in the ocean because they thought the earth was flat. And then somebody <laughs> went a little further and found out there was more to go. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we never would have went further. So it's the same right. thing in a human, you know, ocean, if you will. Same thing, the human voyage. Same thing. Go a little further. You don't know till you go. Yep. And one guy who went a little further this weekend is the great Alexander Usyk. Adds to his Olympic gold medal unified cruiserweight champion and now unified and undefeated heavyweight champion of the world the great alexander Usyk. incredible performance from start to finish maybe he gave up two or three rounds i would say conservatively we got it right we'll, we got it right we got it right we got it the, we got it right and you hit the nail right on the head. You said he was going to win it. He did it. He did everything that we expected him to do. He behaved like a champion all night long, and he took it to Joshua, and you called it exactly right. You had Usyk from the beginning, and he delivered. And I know the fans are dying to hear what you thought about the fight. And as you give you a breakdown, one of the questions that I've got from a number of people is, what can Joshua do to get better for the next fight, if anything? Because he got outboxed all night long. He got rocked. Uh, I didn't see Usyk get hurt at all. I know he took some shots. Obviously, his face was busted up, but I don't think that that tells the whole story. So with that said, what did you see in the fight, and is there anything you think Joshua can do to get back and get better in time for a rematch? Well, let's, let's take care of, you know, what's in front of us first, what happened. You know, let's, let's take care of that first, uh, and then we'll get to the other. But... We got it right in the fight plan. So if uh, maybe maybe that's my answer. I'm I'm not being snide. I'm not being a wise guy, but a little bit. But not being a wise guy. I'm being a little, you know, a little joshing, as as a great fans that I love across the pond. A little joshing uh, by saying maybe he should watch the fight plan next time. Maybe maybe <laughs> maybe that might not uh, hurt because uh, the fight plan did pretty good. Not that we always get it right, but we got that one right. The fight plan was a little bit on the mark, um, if I do say so myself. Uh, and dare to be uh, be a, a little bit uh, out there doing that, which is not always polite. But sometimes you you can uh, you can take not a bow, but at least uh, a little bit of a, a, you know, a little bit of a pat uh, that you got it right. And listen, uh, all kidding aside, Custom Auto, my mentor would say to me, you better get it right, Atlas. <laughs> yeah, 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 this is what you do. <laughs> this is what you do for a living. You don't make Italian ices for a living uh, like some of these guys do. Some of these guys, they should be out there making Italian ices. He goes, you know, uh, but you're supposed to know this and hopefully I do. What... What happened, first of all, uh, you know, he followed in the footsteps, and I had talked about that, of the greatest before, up to that point, the greatest cruiserweight champion of all time, Evander Holyfield, who was undefeated, like Usyk, and went on, stepped up and fought for the heavyweight title and won the heavyweight championship, which a lot of people didn't think he could do, and he was an underdog too, just like Usyk was. And people thought he couldn't do it, he was too small. And so he followed in pretty damn good footsteps. And as I said it, I purposely said it, where he followed with 
Holyfield, who had been the greatest cruiserweight champ, had been, because now Uzik might also be the greatest cruiserweight champ of all time, uh, and now he's gone and added the heavyweight belt and and belts uh, to to his collection. I don't even know how many belts that that was for. Was it for one, two, twenty, uh, eighteen? I, I I don't even know. I can't keep track of that. You need a mathematician uh, to keep track of these things. I don't know how many. Whoa, what, how many? <laughs> how many was it for? Was it was it for one or two belts, Ken? I think it was four. I uh, think it was well, the Fury, WBA. The, well, it can't be four because Fury's got a couple of those things, right? So, uh, I think there might be the, a, a random, like a lesser IBF maybe. I think he had the, I know it was the WBA, the WBO, Rob's gonna check and it. the IBF. My man's Rob. Our man Rob's going to check it right now, and that's that's fine. That's what we're supposed to do. But in the meantime, Fury's got the probably the most important one, the linear, right? I mean, yeah. you know, the, he got it from the man who got it from the man who beat the man. Yeah. You know, uh, that old saying. So, uh but he's got the Fury's got the WBC for sure, and Fury and basically Fury has WBC, and I believe Joshua had all the rest of them. Three, it was for three: WBA, WBO, and IBF. You know, so that's what it was for. And then there's a whole there's a whole bunch of belts out there somewhere um, laying around. Um, but in the meantime, he followed the footsteps of a of a warrior, uh, Evander Holyfield. And the difference right from the beginning of the fight, I get right down to the nitty gritty, was the jab. You know, Usyk, and I, I tweeted out to my man, Rob, and he put it right out there. Uh, too bad they couldn't get it in the corner of Joshua. Might have helped a little bit. But he was snapping his jab, Usyk. He was using it. He was snapping it. You know, southpaw jab from the, the opposite side, from the right side. But he was snapping the jab out while Joshua was pushing it out. When you push it out, that's a polygraph test. See, I'm going to tell you something, Ken. When you're pushing your jab, that that is secret code for without having to verbalize it, you're telling the other guy, I'm looking to hit you with the right hand. Yeah, if you're orthodox. I'm looking to hit you with one punch with the power punch because I'm just trying to set you up. That That's what's... Uh, you're giving them further amplification of what you're trying to do, further warning uh, of what you're trying to do. Uh, you, you can't control a guy if you're pushing your jab. And he needed to control him, he being Joshua. We said in the fight plan, he needed, even if he jabbed to the chest, he needed to stabilize the movement, uh, the sniping power, the sniping ability, the pot shotting ability uh, of Usyk on the outside. He needed to do that with his jab, snapping his jab, not pushing it, not pushing it. And um, he pushed it. And Usyk was snapping his. So that's number one. That's number one. And and when you're snapping, you're setting the table to eat. And Usyk was setting the table with his right hand jab to eat with the left hand. That's what he did. He went and ate. Matter of fact, he gave he gave Joshua a stomach ache. You with those left hands. He 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 did. He he gave him he gave him some uh, indigestion. There's no doubt about that. Uh, he was controlling the fight. Uh, his defense was good. I thought he could have moved, he being Usyk, he could have moved to his right a little more because when he did stand in front or move to his left, sometimes the right hand caught him. He needed to move. Uh, he never got caught like bang, like bang, like real, real clean. Um, again, that might have been because Joshua was showing him that he was looking for too much instead of snapping the jab and keeping him busy with a snappy jab where he wouldn't have had the eyesight to see the right hand coming, you know, uh, and and he, the rhythm would have been better for Joshua. Uh, the other thing was he, Usyk, again, Usyk, I thought he could have moved to his right a little bit more, away from the right hand, um, and used his jab on that side a little bit more. And you know what? There's a lot of people, but it's okay. I'm going to, as I always do, I'm going to say what I feel. He could have followed up a little more even earlier. He might have got a stoppage. But I don't blame him for not doing it because he was following the rules or the, the orders of his corner, and it was right. <laughs> don't give the big guy the one chance he had the right hand to land, you know, to hurt you, to stop the fight, to end the fight immediately, pull the plug on it all. So he, he was being smart. He was being safe. He was being calculating. Uh, he, he, but I still, I'll say it again, he could have went for it. Even in the third round when he shook him up, I think it was the third round. But there were spots where 
when he hurt him with the left hand, he could have he could have followed up a little bit. Smart, responsibly, off to the side, behind the jab, you know, but he could have. Uh, so, but he didn't. At the end, hey, we'll get into that a little later. But at the end, also, he could have. But then again, he might have been cheated out of six seconds at the end, too. Because there's a video floating around that <laughs> that his manager, Agus Clemens, put out there that that seems to show that six seconds would take it off the clock somehow. You know, any of you guys find that six seconds, my beloved fans out there? Hey, I love you. Put down the crumpets just for one minute. One minute. Any of you guys find that six seconds out there? I don't, okay, I'm just wondering. Is it, I don't know. Is it, is it out there? So, uh, look, maybe, maybe it was legitimate. Maybe the clock didn't sync up with the official clock. We don't know for sure. You'd have to sit there with a three-minute you know, timer, and, and you would have to time the whole round to see whether or not six seconds were taken off. But again, his manager put out a video that seems to show that they rang the bell six seconds short. Uh, when I noticed it in real time. I thought the same thing. Like, what the hell? They just said nine seconds. The bell's ringing. What's going on and, here? And he had him in trouble. He had him... He had him in Big trouble, trouble. Uh, against the ropes. And listen, Joshua was moving his head defensively, trying to survive, and he did survive. But I thought right there's a good spot to just bury one to the body. Bang! Bury one to the body of your Uzik, you know, and freeze that head movement. Then go upstairs and finish. That's how I teach fighters to finish a guy, you know, because they're going to survive. They're going to move their head. When they're hurt, they're automatically going to move their head to try to survive. That's what they're going to. So hit. So don't chase what's moving. Hit what's not moving, the body, and then freeze the head movement by doing that. But again, he, uh, I thought Joshua missed the boat. He didn't have as good a game plan, obviously. It seemed like his game plan was just go in there, be the bigger guy, and land the right hand, go home. You know, there wasn't enough to it. And, and that hurt him. Uh, Usyk had a better game plan. Also, he missed the boat, Mr. Joshua, when he didn't go to the body more. There was one round when he went to the body and it affected the smaller man. There's no better way to impose your strength and advantage in that area on a smaller man than to go to the smaller man's body. It's it's simple physics. It, it really is. And um, he didn't go to the body enough. There was one round, seventh, whatever round. I can't remember what round. But whatever round it was, midway, a little past midway point, where he went to the body, he being Uzik, I mean, he being Joshua, and it made a difference. It impacted Uzik. But he didn't, he didn't go there too little too late. He didn't go there enough. I, I thought he should have. I should thought that because that would have taken some of the air out of the tires because he was using those wheels real well. And it would have taken some of the air out of those legs, out of those wheels a little bit, slowed him down a little bit, uh, made him a little easier to catch, uh, made Usyk a little easier to catch. So I thought he missed a boat in a few areas where of preparation where he should have been prepared, especially with the jab, not using the jab to the chest, not snapping it out enough. Um, it was an ebb and flow fight. It was a back and forth. I thought that Usyk got out to the first three. The, the judges, it looks like they might have been uh, they might have been trying to rob the guy, maybe because <laughs> <laughs> because the first three rounds I thought really I thought it was kind of easy that Usyk won the first three rounds and they they giving rounds to Joshua. I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know. It was be be friendly to a Brit day, right? I, I I'm not sure. Well, whatever it was, um, but. I thought he won the first three rounds. Then I thought Joshua won his first round in the fourth. And then I thought it was like back and forth a little bit. I, I thought that uh, that uh, I thought that Usyk was never behind. It was always it was always Joshua trying to catch up. But he was evening it up. He caught up. It was even. You know, it was back and forth like that, ebb and flow. And then. Every he never allowed Joshua to keep the momentum. Every time that was a key. Every time Joshua came back and evened it up, which he did, uh, then Uzik would, with that competitiveness, that you know, that that just understanding, like I said, like I did say, he knew how to win. That that's a talent. That's an ability. That that is it. That that is a trait that he had going in that I thought was very important. People downplayed it or people didn't even look at it, to be honest. He knew how to win. This guy knew how to win. And he understood by knowing how to win what to do. Excuse my back hurts a little bit. 
what to do and what not to do. And he knew not to let this guy get the momentum. So when he would even it up, he'd come back the next round with a big round. With a big round. And he always had that left hand uh, was able to steady the boat when he had to. You know, he landed the left hand. And it affected the bigger guy. It affected Joshua. Uh, so he never let him get that momentum. And then finally, it was even, 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 you know, eight, nine, right around nine rounds. And then all of a sudden, he took the momentum. He just took control. And he, and he just swept those last three rounds. He swept them. And he almost stopped them. He almost stopped. He being Usyk, obviously. He almost stopped them uh, at the end. You know, he, he took it home. He took it home. He took it home. Like, you're going to take it home in that race. You know what I mean? Down the stretch. <laughs> Down the stretch they come. You know, where the jockeys go to the whip, where, where people go to their own whip, you know. And uh, he did. He went to the whip. And he, he, he separated himself uh, down, down the stretch. And listen, at the end of the day, here's, here's the thing. It's going to cause a little ripples out there across the pond. But it's fair, I think. Uh, do we give all the credit to Usyk? Which I do. I do. But do we also say that the so-called pundits, the experts out there, there's so many of them, oh my God, uh, that know so much, so much, so much, um, that maybe, maybe, maybe they overrated this man, Joshua, maybe. Uh, that, uh, when we look at the record, who did he beat? He beat a 40-year-old Klitschko. He got dropped by him. He got off the floor. I give him all the credit in the world because Klitschko could punch with that right hand even at 40. But he got off the floor and he stopped Klitschko. Okay. Um, and Klitschko been knocked out, what, four times, five times in his career? whatever but but Klitschko was a dominant heavyweight for 10 years um with whoever was there but who did he beat who 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 is he beaten he got he beat he got knocked out by Ruiz this is the same Ruiz who well, he, and Ruiz took the fight on short notice. But he came back and he redeemed himself against Ruiz. He did. Give him credit for that. He won. He beat him. He reinvented himself. Everything. Uh, his body, his style, everything. And he and he faced the dragon and he slayed the dragon. Or at least he outboxed the dragon. I don't know if he slayed him. But then this is the same Ruiz who struggles with a 42-year-old, I think something like that, Chris Ariola, who'd been knocked out several times. He struggled, and Ariola's a tough son, but he's 42 years old. He'd been stopped you know, a few times, and he struggles, and he can't, he can't hurt Ariola. He can't, yet he destroyed Joshua, destroyed him in that first fight. But he can't hurt a 42-year-old Ariola who's been, you know, who's been knocked out several times. So how, I don't know, you want to get into the chin area a little bit or whatever, but whatever, was, was he as great as people made him? No, I don't think so. No, he also struggled with a Joseph Parker. Look, Parker's a big, strong guy who moves, uses his legs, boxes, one-dimensional, but he boxed a little bit. That should have been a kind of pre-warning. It was to me. It helped me pick Usyk because when I looked at the Joseph Parker where he boxed not nearly as efficiently as Usyk, not nearly with the skills Usyk has, with the legs Usyk has, or the fluidity that Usyk has, or the dimensions that Usyk has, but Parker used his legs a little bit, moved a little bit. He went 12 rounds with Joshua. I don't know. Was it fair to say he gave him trouble? I don't know if he gave him trouble, but he was in there. He was competitive, and that could have been a warning, a precursor to tell you, hey, wait a minute. If Parker did this one, what is Uzzah going to be able to do? I know he's not a big heavyweight, uh, but still, he's a better all-around fighter. He's got better legs than him. So what's he going to do if, if, if Parker showed the blueprint that you could do that? You could box and give him a little trouble. What's he going to do? Not to mention what Ruiz did to him. So what? Did, so how good was, at the end of the day, how good was Joshua? I mean, really, they, I know the Brits love their guys, and I, I'm with you. I'm not joking around. I'm not trying to tease you right now. But let's be honest. How good? How good? Look, at the end of the day, Uzuk was good. <laughs> Uzuk was good. Uzuk was damn good. Um, but maybe, maybe Joshua, we... We built them. I didn't, but maybe, maybe everyone built them up, or some people built them up. Maybe a little bit too much. Uh, and but at the end of the day, again, all hats off to Uzik. Uh, he goes over there into enemy territory. 
you know, he, uh, he, he, he beats the guy up. He beats up the judges. He beats everyone up. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, 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 he, uh, and then he's gracious about it. He's gracious about it. He's a good man. He's a good man. He's a man easy to root for. He's a winner. He's a winner. He's a winner. Like the Raiders are right now. <laughs> well, Howard Foster, the uh, the judge, did everything he could to try to give the fight to Joshua. He had the score of 15-13, which seems to me just to be preposterous. But, you know, between that and the six-second short in the last round, it looked like they were doing everything they could up to the last second to help Joshua as much as they could, but it wasn't enough. Usyk just outclassed him all night. So congratulations to... Um, Usyk, his team, Agus Clements, uh, you know, those guys have got quite the stable over there with Lomachenko, Alex Vosdick. They continue to roll. Um, Teddy, did you see the, um, you have anything else before we move on to some other boxing news on the uh, Joshua Usyk fight? I want to tell the British fans, you know, um, chin up, chin up. Chin up. Usually we say chin down. Real, you know, when you're fighting, you want to protect your chin. But when you're just talking to friends, I'm talking to friends. Chin up. Chin up. Uh, battle on. Chin up. Battle on. It's, <laughs> it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You've been down this road before. You guys are resilient, right? You always come back. You always come back. And um, it's okay. And listen, you got the rematch. You know, uh, let me answer that question that... That people, let me put in a square answer to that, a straight answer to, to what the fans had asked, what could he do different, he being Joshua. Uh, again, getting around, but halfway serious. Uh, watch our fight plan. That's number one. Uh, that might help a little bit. But use your jab, snap your jab, number one. Be the boss. You were supposed to be the boss. Be the boss. You're not the boss when you're doing this, when you're pushing your jab, just looking for one punch. You're not the boss no more. Be the boss. Be more assertive. Be more assertive, you know. Uh, act like the bigger guy. Be smart and everything, but act like the bigger guy, you know. Don't just wait for it to happen. Make it happen. You were waiting for the right hand to land, waiting for a spot. No, no, control with other areas, like the jab. Do other things. Do other things. Be assertive. Be the boss, you know. Um, definitely, uh, you know, the simpler version is move your hands more, you know. Uh obviously uh control the rhythm control the pace of the fight but but really what i said initially be the boss uh you know uh, uh, control the guy with that left hand you know control him you know don't allow him to be the guy in control but you know it's so that and look you're you got that power so you're always in it you don't know how he's going to come back mentally now and you don't know how Usyk's going to come back how much it's going to improve Usyk you know in his mind he might be saying it could be a mistake but in his mind he could he might be saying hey you know I know I can hurt him you know what this time I think I'm going to look to hurt him early and I think I'm going to look to take a shower early you know I mean, he, he could have that guy. But at the same time, Usyk's a smart guy. He knows how to win. He's a smart guy. So he would contain that. He might think that, but he would still do what made most sense. But I just wanted to answer the question to the fans that you put out there uh, and made sure that you covered them, which is I'm glad you did. Uh, and, and again, just uh, it's okay, guys. I love you guys. I love you over there across the pond. Uh, Everything is going to be okay. Everything will be okay. In other boxing news, Caleb uh, Plant and Canelo Alvarez have their first official face-off um, last week, and they got into a brief shoving match. Uh, well, not brief. Uh, Canelo Canelo shoves Caleb Plant. Caleb Plant comes back with a, a, a left hook of a slap to the face, and Canelo hit him with a one-two, busted his eye open under his eye. I don't know if the sunglasses cut him or what, but Canelo alleges that Caleb Plant called him a mother effer, and uh, he took it as a slight towards his mom when I think that that's... I don't know that that's what Caleb Plant meant by that. But the funny thing is that that's a, that's a term that Canelo has thrown around at other people most recently, at Bubu Andre. Uh, uh, Demetrius Andre at a press conference that Andre stormed into and, and, and Canelo called him a mother effer a few times and told him to get out of here and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, 
Canelo, like I said, shoves Plant. Plant slaps him in the face. Looked like Canelo may have may have ducked it and then hits him with a beautiful one-two, cuts his eye open. The whole thing seemed unnecessary. I'm surprised Showtime or someone in the camps didn't have someone close by so that when he shoved him, at the very least, they could have got between them, but they didn't, and they were left to like fend for themselves, and that's what happened. They're lucky that the cut wasn't worse than it was. What would you think there? Um, well, Dana White would have been in the middle of that, right? He would. He wouldn't have oh, allowed. Yeah. That. I mean, an old kid in sight, but uh, that guy, what's his name, Espinos over there that runs things. He, I guess, that's not something he's going to be looking to do, um, or even think about doing. But um, you know, uh, maybe it. It maybe it just brought more pay per view buys to this fight. I don't know. Maybe it did. I'm not saying that it was put on. It was real. But at the end of the day, the effect may be a couple things. One, that it brings a little more pay-per-view because uh, I, I don't think it was going to do big numbers. And um, But maybe it helped that way. Then again, it also might make some people think, hey, he already lost to him. Why watch it? <laughs> yeah, you know, yep. he, he lost to the... <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people would be like, he lost in the press conference. Like, we're going to watch the fight now? You know, like, it's it's kind of done already. But so uh, you, you got to give, uh, a lot of people say you got to give credit to Canelo for his reflexes. Uh, he had he was ready. You know, he was ready like you're supposed to be. Uh, uh, he shoved the guy. What did he think the guy was going to do? Bring chocolates back to him, right? I if mean, you watch that, if you watch that video after he shoves him, he has like keys or something in his hand. And as Caleb moves back towards him, he throws the keys down and he's ready because you see yeah. the way he tried to slip that slap yeah, and came yeah. right back. Bop, bop. That's what I mean. He knew he's a fighter. I mean, he knew what he's supposed yeah. to know. Really? Like we joked earlier well, that I got the fight plan right um, with the Joshua uh, Uzuk fight. Like Cuz would say, you better get it right. You st- uh, this is what you do, Teddy. You're supposed to know. So, yeah, he, he's supposed to be ready. <laughs> like I said, he shoved the guy. What's the guy going to do? Bring him flowers? So, <laughs> uh, yeah. right? And so, uh, yeah. so he did what he... Uh, now, look, psychologically, he might have the edge right now. Really? He might have the edge. I'm I not inside so. the m- mind or body of or heart of, of Plant. And I like Plant. Um, I'm not inside him. But he might have the little edge right now. But part of being a pro is to, to shove that stuff off to the side. That's part of being a pro. No matter what happens, no matter what's going on around you, no matter what fires have started around you, uh, you know, so to you know, so to speak, uh, a pro is not deterred by anything. He's not influenced or compromised by anything. Just ready to do his job. That's a pro. That's the real thing. Not getting paid. That's the definition that I was brought up on with Customano as a pro. A guy who's ready to do his job, no matter what happens around. Or during. So, we're, we're, that'll be tested in plant. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, does it delay the fight? He got cut under the eye. Does it delay the fight a little bit? They can put a mask on and still do sparring, I'm sure. But do they want to put a mask on? Because that changes things a little bit. You got to wear a mask. You know, now your judgment's a little bit off with slipping punches. Sometimes you get a false sense of security. Yeah, your defense is in a sharp because you know you got the mask on. You can't judge where the punch is coming because the mask goes out four inches. You know, so so that, those are things a trainer, those are things that, that I think about when I think about all the consequences, the collateral damage possibly caused by such a thing, uh, you know. But it, it probably did bring more interest to a fight. Uh, I, I saw this fight from the beginning. We're not here to break it down. But real quickly, I saw this fight the same way as I saw the Billy Joel Saunders, which I picked Canelo to, to win easily, you know, to, to dominate in the end. And he did. He stopped him. Um, I know he broke his cheekbone, of, uh, orbital bone, but, but I'm saying he started to dominate. He, stayed, he took control. He landed the more consequential punches and... I, I just didn't think Santos could keep him off with anything. I didn't think he could outbox him. He wasn't a good enough boxer to do that. Um, and, and I think Plant is very similar in styles and abilities to Santos. 
Uh, uh, very much. In some ways, Sanders might be a little more physical, a little bit. Neither guy is real physical. And look, I like Plant. He's a good box. He's got the most out of his ability. That's all you can ask from somebody. Terrific, terrific. Uh, and I give him credit for that. Um, but I also call it as as I see it. Uh, I I don't see before this even happened. I don't see him being any more competitive than Saunders was. You know, as far as a physical matchup as the fight goes. Um, but uh, does this change things? It definitely changes the perception, you know, to, to the fans to and, and mentally uh, with the fighters. You know, we'll see how it influences them, if it does, or how it impacts them. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I did think it was unfortunate because, you know, I don't think you really want to see that stuff. They're going to fight. Like nothing could be more um, macho manly than fighting. You don't need anything as a you know uh, a precursor to it. Yeah, as a you don't need a appetizer for it. You don't need a you know a, a first course uh, yeah. served before. There's nothing more tougher, manly, macho, whatever you want to call it. Um, than getting in the ring or the cage. So that's where it should be. You, you don't need something else to tease it, to to, get, to serve an appetizer for it, as I said. So, uh, and, and the guys, the fight could be off. It could, it could have been off. You know, you could risk the fight. And, and they, should, they should start taking some attention because they create these things. They put them in the face-offs. Well, you know that these things could happen. I mean, it's not a shock that it happened. It's not. It's happened before. You know, it, it might not escalate to the point that this one did, but sometimes it does. We've had brawls at, at press conferences. So they should take, uh, there should have been more, you know, that guy that runs Showtime over there, whatever his name is, he should have, you know, he should have taken more precaution, you know. Um, he should have taken a little more precaution and, and have somebody there to make sure that this doesn't escalate. But anyway, that's that's my feeling on that stuff. Cool. Well, listen, before we get into the uh, UFC action, I just want to take a minute to give a shout out to today's sponsors. One of the products that I credit with keeping me healthy through the pandemic and in preparation for the upcoming London Marathon, and that's Athletic Greens. I know that that's a favorite of yours as well. I've been taking it every day. I've got it already packed with me to go to London tomorrow. It's the all-in-one supplement for your health and immunity, especially during COVID. You should be taking it. Teddy, I know you've been taking it every day. How are treating you now listen the great thing about it is you can skip a meal and and you can keep yourself going you know sometimes my schedule just sometimes i don't manage my time properly um i just go and do what i got to and all of a sudden like oh man i you know i don't have time right now to eat something so you take you take a glass of that and um or even a glass and a half of that and then all of a sudden, you're okay. You know, you can skip that meal. And you know that you treated your body right. You know that uh, you're keeping the calories in hand and you're, you're doing all the nutritional things you need to do. So uh, for me, that's uh, it's great in a lot of ways you can use it. But for me, that's one of the greatest ways you can use it is to get through a busy day and, you know, know that it'll keep you going. Know that it's kind of like the pit stop in the Indianapolis 500 where, you know, you you don't want to run out of gas. You know what I mean? You don't want to run out of gas, but at the same time, you don't want to stop at a gas station. You know, you got to, you got to, yeah. you got to be moving. You got to be moving. You got to change those wheels fast and you take a glass of that and you know what? You're good for a couple more hours. Yep. These guys spent 10 years with top nutritionists and doctors to create this formula. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. It's got vitamins, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics, and antioxidants. Like I said, it's like an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. To take advantage of the free offer, go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas, A-T-L-A-S, to get five free travel packs with your first order. Again, five free travel packs with your first order. I love these travel packs. It's what I take with me when I'm going. That's what I'll be taking with me to London. If you like the podcast and you want to support us, give Athletic Greens a try. It helps us greatly with production value. Athleticgreens.com slash atlas. 
We appreciate you guys. Teddy, let's talk UFC. I would say that there were some uh, tough guys in the fights here, but as we've said many times, that's a precursor. If you're not tough, don't even think about a career in the UFC. These guys, it seems like every week we're finding new adjectives to describe the toughness that's on display. I mean, let's start with the Nate Diaz, Robbie, sorry, Nick Diaz, Robbie Lawler fight. I said to Rob at one point via text, I said, this is basically just a face punching contest. I don't see very much defense, or if I do, it's very limited, and they're just taking turns punching each other in the face to see who can, who's going to give up first. And in the end, surprisingly, it was Nick Diaz who said he had enough. It looked like he may have broke his nose, broken his nose. He took a ton of punches. Robbie Lawler appeared to have the better engine all night long. I thought Nick Diaz looked tired right from the beginning. His conditioning didn't look great. His physique didn't look great, but he's so tough. You can never count him out. What'd you see in that one? Yeah, like you said, you know, at this point, saying MMA guys are tough is like saying squirrels like acorns. You know what I mean? They do like <laughs> they like acorns. They do. They they eat them. I mean, these guys. That's what they do. They're they're tough son of a beast. And um, first of all, I, again, honestly, uh, I know everyone loves Diaz. He's one of the brothers. They're, they're favorites out there, and I can see why they're tough and like everyone. And they they just have that fan friendly style, you know, like Rock'em Sock'em Robots. I get it. And he was off six years. This was a rematch from 19 years ago, I believe. You know, they they talk about uh, revenge is a dish best served cold. This one was served cold. It was served cold. <laughs> it was freezing. And and uh, Lola got his revenge. Uh, you know, uh, they talk about, you know, six years. You're, you're, you're off for six years. You know you're going to be at a disadvantage. You come back after six years old. And you know what? It showed. It showed. For, because for me, Lawler was 100% ready. Obviously, he's been active. But he was 100% ready. He was like he was like a laser-like focus on what he had to do, what he was going to do. Great shape. Really crisp with his punches. Accurate. Sharp. Knew exactly what he was going to do. He was just going to keep coming. He was like the, he really was like the ocean. I mean, he was just going to keep coming like the tide and take everything that's on the beach with him. Everything. You got tents, I'll take the tents. You got umbrellas, <laughs> I'll take the umbrellas. You got chairs, I'll take those lounge chairs. I, I'm taking, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> sweeping every freaking thing off the beach. That, <laughs> uh, that's what he did. And he, and he was not, gonna stop and Diaz wasn't in condition for that after six years off again the truth yeah I, I I see why everyone loves him I love him too I see why everyone loves him and loves the brother Nate no, of course but he wasn't in the shape he needed to be to deal with this guy on this particular night after being off for six years yeah his body showed it uh his cardio showed it um and he was too easy to hit. Hey, listen, was he nailing Lola with shots? Yes. Yes, it was Rock'em Sock'em a little bit there. But it was kind of like you knew in the end who was going to get to the end, who was going to win. It was a little bit like a, a dog fighting a cat, which I use the terminology because the cat's going to get strikes in there. The cat's going to get in some tr strikes in there, no doubt about it. But... When you're watching it, you know in your mind there's no doubt that at the end of the day, p p I, I can see Peter being there. Uh, what is it called? Peter? They're going to be after me. Um, Rob's going to have to deal with that. But I, at the end of the day, there's no doubt that the dog's eating the cat. <laughs> he's eating and fur, fur stuff flying and whatever. But he's eating the, yeah, uh, don't throw up. I'm sorry. But he's, he's going <laughs> to eat that cat. He's going to eat the freaking cat. Thank God your kids aren't around and listening to this. They, they say Uncle Teddy was not nice to the cat. <laughs> um, but that's what it was. At the end of the day, with again, Diaz was landing some shots and tough, and it was, it was awful entertaining at the beginning to watch. But I knew right from the beginning you could feel it. You could know. It was, it was kind of like the punches 
that were landing from Diaz were like the impact of raindrops hitting a windshield. They were splashing off, you know? And, and at the end of the day, the windshield wasn't getting cracked. You know, and whatever that windshield was on, it was, it was on a tank. That tank was coming. It was on a, you know, SUV or, or whatever you want to call all-terrain uh, vehicle. That, that vehicle was going up that hill. It was going up that hill. It wasn't, it wasn't stopping. It wasn't stop. You really, you knew the outcome. Yeah, it was entertaining. But the other guy being Lawler was sharper. He was more accurate. He was he was in better shape. Uh, you know, he was getting hit shots. I got you. I got you. But you just knew at the end of the day that he was more prepared to deal with what had to be dealt with. And he wasn't going to be denied. That's the best way I could say it. He wasn't going to be denied. And, and his attitude, everything, and his motor just kept going faster and faster and faster. Yeah, I mean, every time you thought he was putting pressure on, it was like he was just warming up. Because then it would rum, 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 rum. More RPMs just kept coming, just kept coming, kept coming. Changing those gears. He knew what he was doing. He knew the guy was off six years. He knew what he was going to do. And, and he did it. He broke him down. Uh, he broke him down. Uh, and, you know, Diaz maybe shouldn't have came back uh, with him. Uh, I, that's the one great thing you got to say about the MMA, uh, about the uh, UFC. They don't care. <laughs> they ain't giving <laughs> gifts to nobody. They're not giving gifts to nobody. No matter how fan-friendly you are, no matter how popular, and Diaz is as popular, him and his brother, as anybody. As anybody. Yep. They don't care. You're, you're coming to swim? Ha <laughs> ha, I got a pool for you. Right over there. It's called the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> right right there. Yeah, there's sharks in there. There's sharks in there. Yeah. Yeah, there's sharks in there. And everything else. But uh, he, give him credit. He came back. He showed. But, but I think it was bad judgment for Diaz to come back, not being better prepared, what seemed to me uh, to be, to not be better prepared, especially to after six years off, uh, you know, to fight a guy like this. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, it was pretty one one sided towards the end there, and another fight that was very one sided was Valentina Shevchenko put it on uh, Murphy in the um, co-main. Um, I don't know, not much else to say. Um, she really beat her up pretty good. Uh, credit to Murphy for showing a ton of toughness just to be in there. But like we discussed, that's a precursor to even be in the UFC. Um, Shevchenko just continues to dominate. Um, how'd you like that performance? Oh, tremendous. She's, she's a... Oh, wow. She is... Uh, she's a Terminator. I mean, yeah. she's a Cobra. Uh, you know, I thought of a Cobra when I watched it, where a Cobra's always in that position ready to strike. Pop! You know, just ready to strike instantaneously without uh, any wasted motion. She doesn't waste anything. Her fundamentals, her technique is superb. Her attitude, her mentality is off the charts. It's a champion all the way. And she's she's a great counterpuncher and a great finisher. That's what her instincts are. She She is. She's technically real solid, real rounded. Uh, very obviously, very dimensional, standing or on a on a mat, but this was mostly standing, and she is. She just waits for you to make a mistake, and you make a mistake, but you don't get a second chance. She counters beautifully, and. She puts physical and mental pressure on you being a boss, always pushing you because she puts the physical pressure on you with the threat, with the presence, but also mental pressure to break you down where it's like having a gun pointed to your head the whole time. Like, really? Like, like, yeah. like you feel like if I make a move, I'm going to get hit. If I make a mistake, I'm going to get hit. You know, that don't feel good, Ken. <laughs> you talk about pressure. That's a threat. And you don't have to be getting hit to feel it. Just to have somebody that's posed and poised to hit you anytime you make a raw move or any move and to know she will, wow, that exerts a lot of pressure on somebody and it wears you down. So she wears you down mentally and physically. She does. 
If I was, that's what I would be saying if I was commentating. I would make that point. She she really does, and um, I think she could make an argument. I I know Amanda Nunes is is the goat. But I think she could make an argument. I'd love to see that fight. I know they fought twice and Nunes won, but um, I know the second fight was very close. It yeah. was very close. And I just, I'd love to see that because you could make an argument now that I'm taking nothing away from Amanda Nunes. She's the GOAT. But Shevchenko is is right there. She's right there. Um so, I, she, like I said, she's she's got everything. Talent, technique, the mentality, supreme confidence, calm and steady, you know, always on point, you know. You know there's always a bullet in that chamber. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know there's always a bullet in that. She's always ready. Uh, she's, she's tremendous. Uh I mean, she just, she took Paul Murphy apart. Uh, you know, like I said, Murphy, Murphy was like a, she was, she was afraid to, to make a move. Like she knew if she made a move, it could be her last move, you know. Yeah, exactly. She, she, she was it, it, way the, over her head. The pressure on her was kind of like, you know, when you, when you got to, when you're fooling around with like one of your nephews or, or one of your kids uh, and, and you 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 you're fooling around with them like you're having like a slap fight, and you got them like a little obviously under the gun, a little nervous, and you're like this. For the people that are just listening, I got my hands up, and you 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 making a position that like you're gonna throw a punch, and then all of a sudden instead you just touch your hair, and they flinch, they jump. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you got them. Yeah. You got them thinking a punch coming, and then instead you do, you go and you scratch your nose, or you you grab your hair, and and they <laughs> they they jump four feet. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. that's kind of that's how she made Murphy feel. Like like if Shevchenko would have just went to scratch her like uh, her forehead, uh, she she would have moved like you know six feet. So. Uh, and Murphy's a tough, strong woman. So uh, she she was just she was like a goat too, you know. Yeah. Like I said, Nunes is a goat. She's right up there. Uh, she throws everything with snap and precision, like a machine. She's like a machine. Uh, yep, solid in every area. And and you try to get in on her. Forget about it. Forget about it. You know. I know people go, "Be my aggressive. Go get her." Uh, yeah, you go be more aggressive. <laughs> you go get her. You know, trying to get inside on her is like trying to go through like a toll gate when the when the gate is down. Like you ain't <laughs> like how do you go? You can't go. The gate's down. There's nowhere to go, and you no. don't go, and you don't got easy pass. Where are you going? Oh man, and uh, she is. You know, to use one of those old phrases, Ken. She's like a shark in the water when she smells blood. When she smells blood, wow, she, it's like a feeding frenzy. <laughs> she yeah, caught, know. she caught, she caught um, Murphy with a with a beautiful hook, kind of hook behind the ear that threw her equilibrium that hurt her, and bang, it was off to the races. <laughs> so, I mean, she yep. she was like really, it was like watching uh, what, the Nature Channel. Where, where, the, <laughs> uh, where the sharks it's exactly right. go in there and you see the water churning. <laughs> That's what it was like. You see all the, the splashing and the water churning. Man, she just, like a feeding frenzy. She went all, it's over. But uh, yeah, she's, she's special. Yep. And that brings us to what I think was the highlight of the weekend. Oh, I want to mention one Goose. thing about her. One other sure. thing. I always say, rightfully so, I always make a point. At least I try to. To say that these special fighters, how smart they are. The special ones, cerebral they are, how smart they are. Not just tough. And she's a great example of how smart she is. You know, that even even with the even with the post uh fight press uh that she did with the post fight uh interview where she's speaking how many languages? <laughs> how yes, many four how, or five? How many languages? 
You know, so I just, <laughs> to, to that point that I always say that these special ones are more than just physical and more than just physically talented. They're smart. They're smart. And she's great. She's a great proof of that. Uh, and just a great example of that. I just needed to say that. Hey, guys. Quick break to give a shout out to my man, Bardia Helmy at, over at Premier Fight Picks. This guy's one of the top handicappers in the sport. I talk to him frequently about the fights and who he likes. I love the guy. Uh, top combat sports better and analyst. 70% uh, winning record. Publicly tracked for over three years. His longtime success stems from a rich history in martial arts with over a decade of training, competing, and coaching experience. Bardia's subscribers profited big time this past weekend at the UFC 2 266 as he cashed in his max bet on Alexander Volkanovsky and his free bet, a two, two leg parlay with Jessica Andrade and Talia Santos. If you like to bet on fights and you're looking for help in picking winners, visit premierfightpicks.com to subscribe. Again, great value. Bardia is a good guy, really, really uh, knowledgeable on the fighters and what's going on. With seven UFC events scheduled throughout the next seven weeks, as well as the big Fury Wilder 3 fight, uh, it's the perfect time to sign up. Bardia is currently offering weekly, monthly, and annual subscriptions, which will get you access to the best combat sports, quick picks, and analysis analysis out there lastly bardia also gives out free bets and analysis on instagram at premier fight picks and on twitter at pff handicapping go check them out tell them that we sent you from the fight with teddy atlas good luck to everyone that brings us to what i for me was the highlight of the weekend in terms of fights i know Usyk's performance was awesome but in terms of a even back and forth battle at times not even in the in in the scores but at time i mean there were two instances where brian ortega had volkanovsky in submissions where i was like oh it's over he's definitely he's got that locked in tight he had him in a uh basically a mounted and that's guillotine, after and volkanovsky he, was winning was winning the yes. fight clearly so uh, you're volkanovsky right volkanovsky was putting it on him on the feet, busting him up. Ortega had moments, but Ortega jumped on him with a mounted guillotine at one point. Then he had him in a in a um, triangle, deep, deep, super deep. When he had him in the mounted guillotine, um, Volkanovski was doing that kind of kicking and wiggling like you see right before someone's panicking where they're about to tap or get choked out because they're doing everything in their power to get out of that. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe Ortega's going to catch him. And... Volkanovski gets out of it. I, I still he knew can't what believe he was that doing. He wasn't panicking. What he was doing was getting out of it. He was doing exactly, what he had to but do. It had 100%, but it had that look of like, uh-oh. Yeah, of he's the way, and, and even it was like after it, the fight. I mean, he had the look of uh, Hannibal Lecter uh, in the Silence of the Lamps. When he was on the stretch, and he, he made <laughs> believe he went into the convulsions. Remember? And he made yeah. the stretcher yeah. shake up and down. I mean, yeah. he was like he was convulsing. It was crazy. And Otega said in his post-fight interview, I can't believe he got out of there. He's a tough little bastard. I had him in there tight. It was exactly what I had been working on. Nevertheless, Volkanovski, again, I can't, we can't use tough as just doesn't do it justice to describe how how incredibly tough and determined both guys were. I mean, I can't believe that when the ref was looking to give Ortega a way out of there, the doctor asking him, can you see? I thought, oh, he's going to say he can't see or he's going to tell him he can't see his fingers up. Nope. He didn't take the easy out. He went back into they the don't. cauldron. These and guys don't I take mean, the easy out. I really thought they, they gave don't take him any every out. chance. Forget about easy they out. Gave they don't him. take any out. There the is no out. The ref there is no out. Only in. Only in. They gave him every chance to give up. They gave him every chance to say he couldn't see. He was having problems. He didn't take it. Credit to Ortega. He has. They wouldn't a, even know how to get out of a, a restaurant. Really? No. Nope. Because because if it was set out, they they wouldn't go there. They yep. wouldn't go there. They they they. You know how they'd get out by going through the indoor. <laughs> so congratulations not only to Al Alex Volkanovsky but to uh, uh, Gene Behrman Eugene Behrman and all the guys at City Great Kickboxing job by Eugene. Great Dan, job. Dan Hooker with the win earlier in the card got into the he literally flew into Vegas like 24 48 hours before the fight as did his opponent his opponent was dealing with his mom dying the week of the fight these guys are just they're warriors and uh, but congratulations to gene and all the people at city kickboxing they continue to rock they always do the right thing they always show up prepared and ready to fight 
let's get into the fight, Teddy. What'd you see and what'd you like? And my God, there were so many takeaways from this one. Yeah, Eugene has Alessandro, all those guys are always prepared, always have to write. Uh, you're 100% right, Ken, 100%. They remind me in boxing uh, with uh, Crawford's people. McIntyre and all those guys. He's got like three guys. Oh, Brian McIntyre, uh, yeah. Yeah, and he's got like three guys to help. Oh, there's three of them all together with Terrence Crawford. They always have that guy ready. I, I don't mean yep. physically ready. They always have him ready with the right fight plan. Always, always. Yep. And I'm impressed by that. And I recognize that and I appreciate that. And I that's why I mention it. But Volkanovski is a short guy, um, obviously. So strong physically. His attributes, forget about the mental side right now, but his attributes from a physical side, he's technically very solid, uh, physically very strong, always balanced and always in good position uh, in his legs. Very good at judging range, very good at dealing with range in and out, uh, very good and quick at closing gaps. <laughs> Being a shorter guy, he has to be good at that. He's got to close a gap on bigger guys, shorter, longer guys. Very good at closing a gap. Kind of like a young Pacquiao used to close gaps fast uh, and get to you. Uh, really, really good at that. Uh, and um, he's always balanced, kind of like the great champion uh, from Japan, Inoue, where Inoue is always set, always balanced on his feet to get power. Uh, so that's that's his attributes that I see from Volkanovski. Uh, I thought before we get to the crazy part and the fun part and the maniac part of that, because that was one of the greatest fights you're ever going to see. Yeah, I don't care. Boxing, anything. That's the thrill in Manila. I mean, that, that's, that's, yeah, that, I'm telling you. That's that's Mickey Ward uh, and Arturo Gatti, the first one, and uh, Corrales uh, and Castillo, the first one. That's how good it is. That's how good that is. It's 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 unbelievable because those guys went to other places. They left the planet. <laughs> they left the planet. They left us mortals. They made us realize we're mortals, and they're immortals. Yeah, because they choose to be. Because they choose to be. They live by a code, a special code. They really do. Conquer or be conquered. There is no surrender. Find a way or die. And, and you know why they're able to do that? Because in their mind, you can't kill someone twice. In their code, their code of ethics, their code of behavior, their code of, of battle, of conduct, really, just like Anthony Smith that I talked about him on a podcast about this once before when he had, his teeth would be knocked out and they would he basically handed them to the ref. These, these are bothering me. They're, 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 they're bothering me. They're annoying me. <laughs> they're annoying me. They're bouncing around my mouth. Can you hold on to them for me? And then he goes on to, goes back to fighting. Um, they have a cold. It's not about money. It's about pride. It's about the cold. It's about... You can't kill somebody tw twice. This is what I mean to everybody out there. For them, death is to surrender, is to not have dignity. Um, that's death, to not have honor. That, that's death. So, so, so what, once you die that way, you're, you're as good as physically dead. So what does it matter what punishment I allow my body or I put my body through? I'm dead already. If I surrender, if I give in, if I submit, I'm dead. Because my soul is dead. Because I, I now become an empty vessel out on the ocean. I become a ghost ship. Because who's alive if you're not alive in your soul and what you believe in? In, in, in those areas, then you're not alive. Then you're, you're finished. You're, again, you're just a vessel floating around the ocean, being moved, but you're not living. And that's how they look at it. It really is. I understand it. That to compromise those principles, to compromise that code, is to die. So people say, oh my God, the punishment that well it, 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 to them it's not that to them it's life or death 
To them, you know, whatever you have to do not to break that code, not to give in. Because no matter how hard it is, right there, they realize they're more scared and recognize it's harder. And they're fearful. They have fear. They're fearful of living with how they would feel and know tomorrow and all the day after tomorrow's if they break that code. They're more fearful of that than of what they face and feel and deal with today. That's how they look at it. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. You're more fearful of that than the consequences of today because you know tomorrow's never going to go away. You're going to enter into a prison in their mind of regret. And that's a solo prison that's worse than any kicks in the face. And, again, of compromising your code of behavior in this fraternity of samurai. You know, you read a book on samurai, same thing. Same thing. You know, it was about the honor of battle. It was about the honor of being in battle, the the dignity of which you brought into battle. That you don't lose that dignity. Because if you lose that dignity, you'll give up that dignity again. Even if you survive your wounds, you're dead. So they can go face whatever they got to face. Because in their mind, that's not the difficult part. That's not what represents damage. That's not what represents not living anymore. Is what your body does. It's your spirit. That's what matters. That's what's got to be protected. That's what's got to be fought for. And they fight for it. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I had to take the time to say it that way. Because they deserve it to be said that way. Both of them. They deserve it. I sent a tweet out. uh, Because really, you're going to laugh. But I sent a tweet out. I said that if Volkanovsky showed up somewhere, right, and in the, say, the pearly gates, whatever, wherever, and God came over to him and said, Mr. Volkanovsky, you're dead. You know what he would say? (laughs) No, seriously. He would say, who says? (laughs) (laughs) Really, he would say, he would look at God in the eyes and said, who says so? Who says so? I'm not dead till I say I'm dead. (laughs) With all due respect, God. With all due respect, God. I'm not dead until I say I'm dead. I mean, that's, that's what came to me after that fight, and I sent that tweet out along those lines because that's what he represented. That's what he showed. They pulled the curtain back for all regular people to learn, to see what a warrior is, what a champion is, what separates a champion from an ordinary guy or from an extraordinary guy with great, great, great talent, even more talent than them sometimes, even more. But they don't have that. They don't have that cold. They pulled the curtain back to see what a champion looks like, acts like, behaves like when they have to, when the call to arms comes, when the moment comes, when the moment comes. They showed everybody who was watching that what that is, what the definition is when they say, when people talk about the will to win. That's it. That's it right there. When people talk about, oh, the, you know, uh, will over skill, that's it. That's it. Uh, You know, finding a way. Not being denied. Refuse to lose. You know, all those terms, all those fancy terms we love to chuck all over the place. Really. But we don't really have to prove it. They proved it. They put definition. They put better definition than Webster's Dictionary ever could do. Just look at them. Just look at them. You know, if you 
It's like the first time you see something, Ken, you've been told about it, you've heard about it, you've read books about it, uh, and you've been told about the gladiators, you've been told about the, about the samurai, the viking, the, you know, whatever. You've been told about these great warriors, you know, but you've never seen them. You're not sure what they look like, but you've been told and you've read the stories and your parents and your grandparents read the stories to you, you know. And then you also read the Jungle Book, right? And you're just a kid and you get taken to the zoo for the first time. And what do you want to see? You want to see what every kid wants to see. You want to see the lion. You want to see the king. The king. The king of the jungle. You've never seen him. And they start taking you down the path and you're just walking and stuff and, you know, and you just, you see a little sign pointing this way to the lion. You, you know, and you're, you're, you're all excited. You're holding the hand of your grandparents or your parents or whoever it is. And you're walking. You're all excited. And you're getting closer. You didn't get there yet. And then all of a sudden, you hear, Nobody has to tell you. <laughs> you know what it is. And then you turn the corner and there it is. The lion. You know it. Nobody has to tell you now. There doesn't have to be a label on the cage. There doesn't have to be a sign. This is the lion, ladies and gentlemen. No. No. You know what it is. You know it without the mane, without the teeth. As soon as you heard that roar, you know that's the lion. There's no need to anybody to tell you more than that. Well, that's how it was. If you'd never seen a champion, a warrior, a samurai, if you've never seen them before, all you had to do was watch this fight. That's all. Nobody had to tell you. You just watch this fight. And just like you look and you go in that cage, and you, around that cage and you see the lion and you say, Daddy, there's the lion. You look at that, you would say, Daddy, that's a warrior. Daddy, that's a samurai. Daddy, that's a champion. That's all you had to, that's, that's it. Nothing else, just by their behavior, just by their roar. That's it. And that's what I saw. That's what I took from this. I mean, as far as breaking it down in my world, the way I could break down fighting and boxing and striking, the striking part of it, is exactly what you said. I mean, you had Volkanovski in control, and he was, he was winning the fight, winning the rounds, dominating in some spots, and then all of a sudden, he made a mistake. He made a mistake with a great fighter, with Ortega. And he makes a mistake where, I forget if he was throwing a kick or catching a kick, but there was a little space and he left himself a little vulnerable, a little exposed, and he gets caught a straight punch and gets dropped. And that's it. That's the opening. I'll take a bang right on it. And he gets into his world. He gets down on the floor, on the mat. And like you said, he gets him into one of these submission holds. And it's supposed to be lights out, except, Nobody told Volkanovski, lights don't go out in my house. <laughs> lights don't get turned on in my house. Ask my family. Ask my friends who come over. Lights are always on. <laughs> they might flicker a little bit, but they're never shut off. I don't shut lights off. And he did what you said. He went into this convulsion type move, but he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was, and he knew what he wasn't doing. He wasn't submitting. He wasn't going along for the ride. He's going to find a way. Because of all the things I just said, because of the cold, because of the cold. And he did. And then that's not enough. That would have been enough to make it a great, great fight. That wasn't enough. Then he goes into attacking into the ground and pound he's on top of Ortega hitting him with elbows forearms punches fists I mean oh thank god nobody hands anyone like a, whip, a 
I might not play. I mean, uh, because by accident, he would hit him with that. He's hitting him with everything. And I'll take her. No lights out in his house either. No lights out in his house either. And he just barely survives. And then they go at it. <laughs> they go at it again. Another round. And then the same thing. Volkanowski's, you know, controlling things, standing up. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, what happens? He's on top of him. He's grounding and pounding, looking like it's going to end it again. Grounding and pounding. But Ortega just, he refuses to submit. No surrender. And he's hitting him with all these shots. Unbelievable. And all of a sudden, like a python out of a tree. <laughs> oh, my God. Like a, like, like. Like a boa constrictor, the legs go around yeah. his neck. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! You know our legs are the most powerful part of our body. Goes around the neck, and and he's it's over. It's over. No, it's not. Yep. No, you forgot who these guys are. It's no, it's not over. And now it's over. It's got to be over. It's got to be over. It has <laughs> to be over. It has to be over. No, no, no. There is no over. Not with these guys. There is no over. And he gets out of that. And then he goes back to the ground and pound. And the guy's Ortega taking all that punishment. All that punishment. And he's losing a fight. But he he came this close to winning it. And then you figure it's over. It's not over. Then the fifth round goes on after all of that. <laughs> all of that. And what does Ortega do? He wins the round. How's it possible? He does. It's not physically possible, but it but it's it's possible if you believe, if you believe, if you prepare yourself mentally. Physically, of course, they're in great shape, but mentally, if you're willing to go to the darkest caverns of yourself, the darkest crevices of yourself, really. We all have caves inside ourselves. We're we're an endless cave. It's just how far do you go into that cave? Really? How far do you go and 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 search? How far? These guys made themselves for me besides everything i said they made themselves and put themselves on a list of of great great discoverers um you know some of the i'm, I'm trying to remember i want to just see here what what i i mean just great explorers. That's the word I was looking for. They put themselves on a list of great explorers where, you know, an explorer is searching and willing to go to new unseen places, scary places, but to discover, you know, what's there. And with these guys, that's, they put their, they did. They're, they're great explorers. They were willing to go to places that most of us are unwilling to go or that don't even know you can go. Don't even know you. And I don't mean by fist fighting. I mean in anything, anything that is a risk involved, anything that is new, anything that is scary, where there's a threat, an emotional threat, not just a physical threat, you know, a threat to your comfort zone, to your being, to your existence. And these guys like the great explorers that used to go on ships and keep going even when they didn't know if there was giant sea monsters out there. They didn't know. These guys are willing to go out there and there might be giant sea monsters where they're going. They're, they're, it doesn't matter. They're, they're going. Those great explorers went there to discover new places. These guys are there to discover new places every time they get in that freaking that octagon inside that cage. They're, they're looking to discover new places. How much further can I go? And so they, they're all looking to discover greatness. How great can I be? How great can I be? So here's Ortega after all of that physical turmoil and, and punishment and abuse. He wins the fifth round. And the way he won it, the way I would have said it if I was in a corner, the way I said it before that in a tweet, 
It's out there. You guys could see it where I sent it to Rob, where his one physical advantage, he was taller and longer. He needed to use the length of his punches. He wasn't using it consistent enough, Ortega, where he needed to stretch out that jab, needed to extend that jab, where he could catch Volkanovski stepping back or standing in front. He needed to use that length and get full extension on his punches more consistently. And it was there for him. And I mentioned it in a tweet, it's there for him. And in the fifth round, that's what he did. He extended his hands. He got the length. He got the reach that he needed to get to get full extension on his punches. And he was able to catch an effect and impact Volkanovski standing in front and stepping back. It was too little, too late in the end. Or you know what? It was one of those nights. Nothing would have been enough to beat either one of these guys. Nothing. You would have had to bring one of those SWAT mobiles in there. You know what I mean? Like one of those SWAT tanks with like a full SWAT team <laughs> and, 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 and go after them. Maybe, maybe if you did that, you might have got those guys out of there. Other than that, short of that, no. These guys, <laughs> they, they taught us. If we're willing to, to learn that... There is, uh, there are no dark places if you're willing to go and put a light on and venture into them and dare to venture into them. There is no darkness. You can find light. And they found it. They found it as dark as it freaking was one second. They freaking came out on the light. They really did. They're special. They are special. And they represent a special breed when it's done right by these MMA gladiators. They really do. Yeah, awesome event. Awesome night all around for the UFC. Again, I know it sounds like a broken record, but uh, full weekend of fight action. Um, quiet weekend next weekend. We'll, uh, next week, we'll discuss the breakdown for the upcoming uh, Fury Wilder 3 fight. But before we sign off, you got anything else? No, like like uh, George Foreman said to Muhammad Ali in that great fight in Zaire, when Muhammad Ali said to George, that all you got, George? And George said, yep, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect way to wrap things up. <laughs> Guys, thanks for being with us. Like I said earlier, if you like the show, do us a favor. If you're, if you're, if you're concerned about your health and wellness, Give Athletic Greens a try. Please subscribe to the show. I do have one more thing to say. I do have one more thing to say. Again, I said it early. I want to say it late, okay? Um, Good luck. Good luck in that race. Make us proud. Uh, You you already made us proud. You know why? Seriously, I'm I'm being serious. Because you prepared 100% for this. You committed yourself. You're not afraid to go out there and fail. You know, that, that's the key to victory, not being afraid to fail. That's the key. That's the key. Not afraid to put yourself in there with, with all the risk, you know, that's in there running 26 miles and the risk emotionally, just everything. Go fly across the pond to do it. You know, um, it, it's, you know, it, it's a great challenge, but it's a great way to make yourself better, you know, uh, I'm, and I'm not talking about better as a marathon runner. I mean better as a person because you will go through things in that race that you will have to face, that you will have to overcome that ultimately will serve you in your life. They will. It will. It already has in some of your ventures, but it will in this one. It will. It'll make you better. So I just want to say for all the fans out there, I'm representing them, um, and to all great fans out there in Britain and uh, United Kingdom, uh, be there for my man. Come on. Let's see you out there. Bring a few signs and uh, cheer on Ken. Go get him, buddy. Go get him. 
Thanks, thanks, Teddy. And for anyone who wants to follow along, this is the World Marathon Majors Age Group World Championship race. I'll be racing in the 50 plus category. I was ranked number one in the world in 45 to 49 last year. So if you want to follow along, I'll be trying to run under two hours and 30 minutes and win the 50 plus Age Group World Championship on Sunday in London. Teddy, thanks for the kind My money's on you. My money's on you. It is. I'm going to win or die trying, that's for sure. The cold. The cold, thanks, baby. <laughs> thanks for everything, Teddy. Thanks for being with us. And thanks to all the followers and all the uh, viewers. Appreciate you guys. And we'll be back next week. Take it easy.